The book's called Seed to Seed, and what it's about is how to turn your garden into a self-sufficient situation. Uh, for most of us, during the year, uh, in the spring, a big part of uh, starting our garden is to go out and buy seeds. Uh, I know I still do that a lot. Um, but in terms of being self-sufficient, and especially like after a collapse, you know, if that's your plan, you're screwed. Now these are some tomato seeds, and the way that I uh, uh, grab and uh, save the tomato seeds is you, you take them right out of the tomato, you squeeze out the seeds into a little cup of water, let them kind of ferment in there for a couple of days doing some changes of water and that gets rid of that jelly coating on the outside of the tomato uh, seed and then once uh, it's all kind of gone I will pour off most of the water and then pour what's left onto a napkin uh, and you can see this napkin I've uh, collected them up right here and I wrote right here what kind of uh, uh, tomato they came from. These are cherry tomatoes. So uh, I've got those. I've got, you know, this I think is brandy wine. And then this is my own special variety that I've been growing for, for a number of years. So I, I collect them up on here. And once they're dry, I'm not just going to leave them on napkins for, you know, the whole winter. I want to get them into an, into an envelope. Now, a lot of people will take the original envelope that they like maybe buy seeds from. They'll save that envelope and then put seeds back in. But, you know, those envelopes don't last forever or you may lose them or maybe you never had one. Maybe you got some seeds from a neighbor and you want to save them. So I always want to show you what I do, and it's nothing revolutionary, but it's what I do, and you know maybe you'd find it helpful. Uh, I just take a piece of paper, and this is like a print-off sheet from that bug out card game. If you'd like to get your own, there's a link uh, down below if you want to check it out. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I'm just going to use some scrap paper. Uh, so I just take it and I fold it over, and then I'm going to get my seeds on there. I want to do my own special variety. So I'm going to take these guys and just scrape them onto the uh, onto the paper here and it doesn't really matter if I get a little fuzz from the from the napkin that's no big thing it'll just plant right along with them when I plant them next time they're a little sticky but uh, having fermented off that that jelly coat they're not quite as sticky as they would have been otherwise let me just get all of them here so I'm done with that now and what I do with these is I just kind of push them towards the center fold that back over and I just fold the sides up one two now I've got like a little pouch kind of thing going on here where all the seeds are, are right down inside here and I just take the top and fold it over and one piece of tape and that's it. I'll just label it up now. S special tomato. Oh and one thing that I always do that's kind of important is I'll put the year and the year of this recording this is the 20 19 season. So that's it. I mean, it's again, it's nothing revolutionary. It's just a piece of paper folded up into an envelope. But I think a lot of people get fixated on the idea of needing a special container or finding those original packets and just creating your own thing out of folded up paper 
works just as well. It's a wonderful book. It has lots of other information in it. I was lo looking through it just uh, the other day for how to save seeds from basil, and I pretty much know how to save the seeds from basil, but I have the book here, and I just go right to that and be sure that my information is really good. Um, while I was looking through there, I, I came across a uh, little article that I thought was interesting, and it, uh, it connects with a video that I did earlier. You recognize this little pumpkin here? This is the one that we were sort of like manually molesting and uh, you know pollinated a few weeks back. Um, obviously, it's growing well. It worked out. It's starting to turn orange. The, the vine's sort of dying. I'm hoping it's going to get a little more orange before that. Uh, but e even if a pumpkin doesn't turn orange, you can still chop it up and eat it. You know, skin seeds and all if it hasn't really ripened. Uh, I did that. You know, you cook it up like zucchini. Uh, and, uh, you know, still very nutritious. So you know, no matter what, it's going to get eaten. But it'd be nice to have another orange pumpkin. But anyway, getting back to my point. I saw a picture of a uh, uh, squash flower, take shot. I thought that was interesting. I was wondering what that was all about. And apparently, what I did with this when I was manually pollinating it, that is not only uh, not unusual, it's necessary to do it that way if you want to uh, pre uh, preserve the genetic integrity of whatever squash you're, you're growing. And uh, what does that mean? Uh, if you're growing a pumpkin next to a butternut squash, they're both members of the squash family, they can get cross pollinated with each other. So uh, if that were the case, the seeds coming out of this pumpkin might not yield pumpkin later on because they you know, might have gotten pollen from the butternut squash. And uh, you can slowly lose sort of like the desired traits that are built into a lot of these plants. So if you want to have a continuity of your, your various varieties of squash, uh, it's important to tape up the flowers uh, when they're first starting to, uh, to open. Once they become mature and they're ready to be pollinated, open them up, do the you know, creepy manual pollination. You can play porn music if you want to. Uh, and then when you're done, close them back up and then let the, the fruit start to develop. Um, and that'll ensure that, uh, that you have genetic uh, integrity of, of the seeds for the next generation. So that was something that I learned. I just wanted to share that with you. Um, and again, I'm just hoping that this uh, pumpkin can, you know, finish ripening up before the, the, the whole vine falls apart. The, uh, the mold, it's kind of a white mold on there. That's something that happens a lot in my greenhouse. And I want to bring you around the rest of the greenhouse. Um, overall, I'm very happy with the greenhouse environment. I think it's, it's wonderful. It's, uh, you know, just, it's a nice sheltered environment. I can bring things in when it's going to be a little chilly, if they're in pots, obviously. Um, very happy with it, but uh, a lot of times the, the plants, you know, they don't do that, that great in here, if they're here the whole time, like, I'm touching this, and you can see there's this, this white pollen, that's not, it's totally not pollen, it's spores, probably, um, all over it, so plants, I think, in the static air environment, and maybe not getting rain on them, they don't, they don't do so hot a lot of times, so, again, this is something I'm learning about, but through trial and error, um, but I still love, love, love the greenhouse environment. Just all this greenery in here. And a lot of this stuff is going to extend its life out into the fall. So, um, you know, you get to have a little bit more, more green. Everything outside is, you know, dead and dying. And things are still pretty nice and green in here. Um, overall, the performance of the greenhouse has been great this year. I finally got rid of the rat that was digging holes over here. I was very pleased to get rid of that. Um, so my gray water system is finally starting to flow through. And it goes the entire length of this area here. Um, and... Uh, that's all happening now, so that, so that that's all that's all good stuff. And uh, beyond that, just having a having a greenhouse next to your house is an outside wall of my house. Uh, it protects my house from uh, losing heat through this wall as much, uh, you know, in the winter time. Um, and it's it's just wonderful to it's almost like having a scarf wrapped around the house, having it here. I would highly recommend considering doing that. Um, additionally, just in the dead of winter, I can come out here and it's not heated. Um, so it's not like it's a sauna or anything, but it's, um, it's like a fall day in the middle of the winter and you can come outside, feels sort of like outside. It's really nice psychologically to have this space too. And, uh, as you can see, it gives you some extra crap storage space for chairs. That was going to be a reading nook up there. Maybe someday it will. <laughs> Highly recommend greenhouses. Thanks for watching. This episode has been brought to you in part by Prescott Caliber Club and Jeske Defense Strategies. Prescott Caliber Club is a federally licensed firearm manufacturer and retail store specializing in firearms, survival gear, and producing great online content. If you want to thank them for supporting this channel, go check them out at prescottcalclub.com. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. 
And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.